All right, well, I think, uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for, for joining in. I'm, I'm excited about this. I think this is the first in the uh, OAC expert series, uh, experts in quotes. Uh, again, thanks to Carl for the name here. I think that generated a lot of good, a lot of good PR, a lot of interest. So this is the Constellations, the Milky Way, and other dope explorations of the night sky 101. I'm Taylor Sargent, your quote unquote expert for the evening. And uh, here we go. I, I, please feel free to stop and, and ask any questions along the way. Um, I don't think I have a full hour's worth of material. So uh, if you have anything you want further clarification on, please feel free to uh, jump in. All right, so here's my overview, kind of taking a lesson from the comms class that I had this first half quarter. Uh, I know we're only supposed to talk about three things. I threw in a fourth. We're first going to do a quick couple lessons in astronomy. For me, it's hard to know what is considered general knowledge. I've been a fan of space for my entire life, so I really have no perspective on what most people know at this point. So if this is a little too basic. Please bear with me. I'm just trying to catch everybody up to speed. Um, then we'll talk about the spring and summer constellations that you can see in the northern hemisphere. And I'm going to point out a few things that you can see using telescopes that aren't that powerful. Um, and then I'll talk about a couple objects that you can see in the solar system, again, with a weakish telescope. And uh, I'm going to wrap it up with some, some of the reasons why I personally have really liked space my entire life, just the perspective that it's given and uh, some philosophical implications of space I think are, are really quite cool. So I thought I'd slip it into the, the end here if we have, if we have the time. Uh, so astronomy lesson number one is that there are a lot of different types of stars out there. And if you look carefully at the night sky, you can actually see different colors. And those colors tell you different things about the stars. Um, if it's blue, it's much hotter and it falls on this side. This thing is called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And it basically catalogs the types of stars out there. So over here on the left side, you have uh, how hot the star is. Uh, over here, it's much colder. Stars at the top are much brighter. And then those at the bottom are a lot dimmer. And you can see up here that there are letters. It's O, B, A, F, G, K, M. These are how you classify stars. And the way that the, the mnemonic that I learned, it's, it's a bit dated, but it's O, B, A, fine girl or guy, kiss me. Um, that's that's how I learned the, the stars. So <laughs> that's kind of how it's always stuck in my head. But uh, O-class stars are very bright, very big, um, generally very blue. Um, and our sun on this is right about here. It's a very, very average star, but we love it anyway. It's a class V, and right now it's in its main sequence. Over the course of its life, uh, it's about four and a half billion years old over the next five billion years or so. Um, it'll reach a point where it gets very big and red, and it will kind of drift up into this area. Um, can you, can everybody see my cursor? Yep, we can. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so, you know, as it ages, it will drift up into this uh, giant arm, and it'll become red and much larger. And then after that, it will actually drift all the way down here to the white dwarf section. These are not actually stars anymore. I mean, they, they're not stars in the sense that they're not producing fusion at their core. They're just kind of remnants of stars. And this is where our sun will end up in about 5 billion years. So no, no need to hold your breath yet. Um, I'm going to be talking about some constellations in a minute. And uh, you guys may know this already, but over the course of a calendar year, you can actually see different constellations in the night sky at different times across. Uh, during the year. And the reason why that is, is just because the sun or the earth revolves around the sun. So when the earth is over here and nighttime is on this side of the earth, you can see these constellations over here, Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, uh, but the sun is in the way and preventing you from seeing these constellations. Six months later, when the earth is on this side of the sun, the nighttime is facing in this direction over here, and you're able to see these constellations and not these. So that's just a little bit of context as we move forward and why I've kind of broken down this talk into spring and summer constellations, given that those are our current season and the one that's upcoming. Um, so here we go. Taylor, 
One sec. Yep. On the last slide, is uh, are those only visible? Are they most visible during like the the months that we think of as being like the Pisces like um, dates? Do those so, correspond? No, I don't. I don't think so. Actually, I I think the way that astrology is laid out, I know very little about astrology. Um, I realize this is astronomy and not astrology. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bite my tongue on astrology, <laughs> but um, so so I think I think the way that the the signs were distributed is the way that the sun rises. So on the morning of your birth, the sun will actually rise through a constellation that you can't see. Um, so so for example, I'm I'm born in December. I'm I'm Sagittarius, I think. Um, which I think means that the earth was over here. And as the sun rose in the morning, it like from our perspective in the earth, it rose through the constellation Sagittarius. Okay, so so it's it's like a six month offset. Okay, I, I think, don't quote me on that. Cool. I, I, I don't have any of those slides in my backup. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'm pretty sure it's something like that. The, the, the way that it gets a little complicated is that the Earth's orbit has changed over time. And I think all of the established dates for the different astrology signs are actually off by one now, but like it's never been fixed, but it's because the Earth has this thing called a precession and so it orbits slightly differently. Um, wait, it looks like there's, a, there's something in the chat window here. Oh, okay, thanks Carl. <laughs> Anyway, so so that's that, and and again, don't quote me on that, but I I think it's something like that or close to it. So moving on to the uh, northern hemisphere constellations, uh, we're gonna start off. These are constellations. They're called circumpolar constellations. These are ones that you can actually see the entire year round, because uh, at least from the northern hemisphere. Um, these constellations are basically directly above the North Pole. So it doesn't really matter if this uh, Earth is over here or over here with respect to the sun. These constellations are up top here. So you, you, they're, they're always visible. Um, and I'll just kind of point out, since we're the, the OAC club and there's a small chance that we might get lost at night with no cell phones or anything like that, uh, I'm just gonna point out how to find the North Star Polaris here, uh, just in case you need to orient yourself. So we have Ursa Major. Many of you know Ursa Major is the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is only actually just part of that entire constellation. And it's this piece right here that looks like a little pan. Um, one way to find the, the North Star is, the North Star is the tail of Ursa Minor. It's the last star of Ursa Minor, but Ursa Minor is actually a pretty dim constellation and it's hard to make out. Ursa Major is much brighter. So if you follow the pan handle down to the pan and then line up these last two stars of the pan, it actually points directly to the North Star. So that's one way that you can find it. Um, this is Draco the dragon. It's, it's a bit dim. The Cassiopeia is actually pretty brilliant. It looks a little bit like a W. It's supposed to be a crown. Um, Again, I don't, I don't know the, the, the stories behind all of the constellations, but this is just a good way to orient yourself. And then over the course of the night, they rotate um, in a counterclockwise direction. So it looks a bit like this. I, uh, as you can see, I had a lot of fun with my, with my animations. I haven't made many PowerPoints in my life with animations, so that probably uh, drained a good couple hours as I was putting this together. Um, so these, again, these are called circumpolar constellations. They're always visible regardless of when in the year you are. So these are the constellations in the, again, in the Northern Hemisphere in the spring, looking north to orient yourself. Here again is Polaris, the North Star. Uh, you can see a number of the astrology signs running down this way. You've got uh, Gemini here, Cancer, Leo, Taurus is over here. Um, I'm actually going to bring your attention to Orion. Orion's my personal favorite constellation. It's much more visible in the winter, but uh, in the spring you can see it low on the horizon early in the night sky. So it, it, it's on the western horizon over here. And the reason why I like it, well, it's pretty distinguishable with Orion's belt right here. 
but it actually has two uh, what are called stellar gems, which are basically stars in the night sky that are very unique. Um, this one right here is one of Orion's knees, and it's called Rigel. It's a blue supergiant. And this one here is called Beetlejuice, which I'll talk a little bit more in about, about in a minute. It's a red supergiant, and it's a huge star. And then right here is an absolutely gorgeous nebula, the one that's actually behind me, called the Orion Nebula. And this is what it looks like. And if you have a like not not a super crappy telescope but one that's a little maybe a step up above it i i have a telescope where the mirror is two and a half inches and that's not very big um the power of a telescope is really how big the lens is or how big the mirror is or some combination of the two um i have a again a two and a half diameter telescope not not a powerful one i personally can't see the orion nebula with that but if you have a beginner telescope that's a little bit bigger uh, you actually would be able to see this i have a, a reference for telescopes in my uh, references section in case anybody is really inspired after this to go uh, explore further but i actually took out my telescope a couple nights ago to prep for this to see what i could actually what i could actually see in the night sky um what what's next oh yeah so uh, going back to hey Taylor, yeah, um, there's somebody that chatted about uh, the southern hemisphere. So can you like I know a lot of the stuff is the northern hemisphere, but yeah. is there stuff here that you can see in the southern hemisphere. Or what what is kind of different if you were to travel south? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I see this question from Noah. Um, it says, are the stars in the southern hemisphere completely different? Can you see any of the constellations from the other hemisphere? Uh, you can see a few of them. The more south you look in the night sky, the better chance you have of seeing those stars as well in the um, in the southern hemisphere. There, there um, is a completely different set of stars that you have access to in the southern hemisphere. Uh, there's a really prominent constellation called the Southern Cross, and then there's also uh, two actually really small galaxies that orbit the Milky Way galaxy, which is the one that we, we are in, and they're called the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, and those are actually also visible from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it's mostly a different set, and it also kind of depends on where you are. So if you're standing on the very tip of the North Pole, you're going to see a completely different set than if you were standing on like directly on the South Pole. Like that's gonna be 100% different stars. But as you kind of move a little toward the equator, the, the stars that you can see over the course of the night start to overlap more and more, um, if, that, if that makes sense. Um, where, 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 wait, I think I missed a slide. Oh yes, okay, so this is, uh, Go, go, going back one more slide, um, I, I was talking about Betelgeuse here. Betelgeuse is a really, really cool star. It's it's absolutely massive. It's one of the biggest stars that astronomers and astrophysicists have found to date. Um, and it's again, it's the shoulder of Orion. And just for a quick size comparison here, uh, this is just some, some nice perspective. Here's our sun. The sun is about 100 Earth Earths across. Um, and, and this, this visual does kind of a nice job of stepping up and showing the scale of how big stars can get. So if this is the sun, here's a star called Sirius. Um, and if you kind of shrink Sirius down to this size, then you kind of step up and you can see the scale of these two stars with respect to Sirius. Take um, Aldebaran, shrink it down again, and eventually you get to Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse is so big that if you were to place it where our sun is in the center of the solar system, the surface of Betelgeuse would actually reach about the orbit of Jupiter. Uh, so it is an absolutely massive star. And you can see here that it's not even the biggest star. I think VY Canis Majoris is still the largest star that, that uh, has been found. I think there's another one called like UY Scuddy or something like that, that might be slightly bigger. Um, but stars can get really, really big. And uh, here's a nice example of that. The other cool thing about Betelgeuse is it's, it's really, really old uh, with respect to its life, with uh, respect to its like life, expected lifespan. Um, bigger stars and brighter stars, 
they burn really hot, they burn really fast. And it's kind of like that live fast and die young mentality for big stars. Um, Beetlejuice is one of those. And uh, uh, astronomers think that Beetlejuice is actually gonna go supernova here soon. And supernova is the way that large stars end their life. It's basically a really, really violent explosion. And supernovas are spectacularly bright. So Betelgeuse is something like 670 light years away from us. It's quite far. But if it goes supernova, you'll be able to see the brightness during the day. And at night, it'll be about as bright as a full moon. Just, just from a single star that's 670 light years away from us. And, and it'll actually stay about that bright for a month. So I personally have my fingers crossed that this happens at some point in our lifetime because it would be absolutely fantastic. I think recent estimates are that it'll happen like 10,000 to 100,000 years from today, which cosmically speaking is a blink of an eye. But I'm, I'm, I'm staying hopeful that it'll happen in the next you know, 60 to 70 years optimistically. Taylor, one question from a noob in astronomy. So, uh, so these stars are billions and billions light years and kilometers away from us. And how do the scientists measure their size? I know that the telescopes are extremely strong, but still they are extremely far away. And how do they do all these things? You know, how do they know that, for example, Aldebaran is so big? Yeah, that that's an that is an excellent question. So there are a couple of tools that astronomers and astrophysicists have to look at stars. Um, and a quick, a quick clarification, uh, all of the stars that you can see in the night sky are maybe a couple hundred light years away, if not closer. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the furthest star that you can see in the night sky, but um, there's actually only about 5,000 stars visible with the naked eye in the night sky. And that's, that's from all of Earth. So at any one given uh, time, I, I'm getting a, my internet connection is unstable. Can, can everyone still hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so at, at any one given time, you're only able to see about two to 3,000 stars in the night sky. Um, and, and, and again, they're all within a couple hundred light years of us, maybe a thousand light years of us. One way that they're able to determine the size is that the size and the brightness are oftentimes uh, in correlation. And they can actually look at the type of light that's coming out of a star through something called spectroscopy. So they know that uh, through looking at um, Aldebaran, you see that it's kind of orangish in color. That they're able to determine that one just by looking at it in the visible light, so the light that we can see, but they they also have different filters that they can put on their cameras to only allow certain frequencies in. And they can check the um they can check how much of a certain frequency of light is coming from that star and be able to determine its composition. And if they know its composition and they know its brightness, a lot of times they can then infer how big it is. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. And um, one way that they can figure out how far away it is, is through something called parallax. So if you hold your finger out in front of you and you close one eye, and then you close your open eye and open your closed eye, you can kind of see that the background behind your finger shifts, okay? So that's called parallax. And the way that, the way that um, we can measure parallax from the earth is that if you have the earth, here, if this is the sun and you have the earth here and you're trying to look at something really far away, you can take a picture of that thing when the, when the earth is here and then wait six months for the earth to move over to this side of the sun. That's basically like our other eye, okay? One eye is here, we move six months when the earth is on the other side of the star, that's our other eye. And you can see how the stars in the background shift with respect to the star that you're looking at. And that's one way that you can then figure out how far away it is. It's basically creating that triangulation so you can determine distance. Good? Awesome. All right. Moving on. Uh, so uh, this is now the southern 
or I'm sorry, summer constellations in the Northern Hemisphere. We're looking north here uh, for perspective. Again, here is the North Star. Um, what, what, what do I have to, I wrote down some notes here. Oh yeah, so um, you can see that you can no longer see uh, Orion. It's, it's not visible in the summer. Oh wait, one sec, there's a couple more chats. <laughs> All right. Um, glad you guys are enjoying this. Uh, so you can't see you can't see Orion anymore. It's 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 fully gone. Again, though, you can still see Cassiopeia. You can still see Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the circumpolar constellations right in the center here. Um, one one thing that I really like about the summer night sky is there is. It's not, it's not technically a constellation, it's called an asterism, which is a grouping of stars that's not technically a constellation, but it's like a very popular grouping of stars. Uh, technically, this, the Big Dipper is an asterism that's part of the constellation of Ursa Major. Um, another asterism in the summer night sky is this thing called the Summer Triangle, which is a triangle between Vega, Deneb, and Altair up here. Uh, this is a pretty cool, it, it, it's very identifiable in the summer night sky. Each of these stars are actually the brightest stars in their respective constellations. Um, another thing that's interesting to see in the Northern Hemisphere in the summer is the Andromeda Galaxy. So the Andromeda Galaxy is in the constellation Andromeda. Um, it is our closest large galaxy. It's about 200 or it's about 2.5 million light years away and it's about the same size as the Milky Way is. Um, you can see this in the night sky without a telescope. You just have to be in a very dark area completely away from light pollution and you can see kind of this fuzzy thing on the on the horizon. If If the Andromeda galaxy were actually brighter it would stretch four or five times the width of a full moon in the night sky. So this thing is 200 or 2.5 million light years away. Uh, this is just a, to, to give you some scale and it would still be four to five times the width of the full moon in the night sky if you could see it. Uh, but if you have a weak telescope, you can actually uh, look at it. You won't be able to see the whole thing in a weak telescope again because it covers such a massive area of the night sky. Um, but Fun fact is we're actually on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. We're going to collide in about 4 billion years. But the, the fun thing here is that uh, there's so much distance between stars that even when the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy collide, probably no stars will hit each other. Uh, if, you think about, if you think about our nearest, the nearest star to the Earth, uh, other than the sun, is called uh, Proxima Centauri. And it's 4.2, something like that, 4.2 light years away, which is trillions and trillions of miles. So that's a lot of empty space. And even though each galaxy has like 100 to 400 billion stars, they're just going to basically pass right through each other and then pass through each other again. And they'll, they'll keep doing that until uh, they become this one big blobby galaxy called an elliptical galaxy that will be, um, I think scientists have named it the very creatively, the, the Milkometer galaxy uh, once that happens in four billion years. Uh, sorry, we've got a couple more chats here. What's the closest dark place we can go see it? I'm not sure yet. That's actually, now that you mentioned it, Noah, that was something that I meant to include in this presentation, but I forgot. But by the time, I, I, I'm happy, Noah, to uh, send you a couple resources. I think, I think actually like two hours a little bit northeast of here, there's a pretty good dark spot to uh, potentially see these things. Um, Death Valley, uh, Steve Roseman says, yeah, Death Valley. Yeah, that, that could be a really good spot to go see it. Hopefully we can go explore some of these places in the, in the fall or winter next year um, and really, really see these these cool things in the night sky. Um, but yeah, so this is the Andromeda galaxy and this is what it actually looks like in the night sky. Absolutely fantastic. Um, it's about 110,000 light years across. 
uh, for perspective, the Milky Way is about 100,000, so pretty close in size. Um, and again, we are on a direct collision course with it. Um, moving on to now, this is still northern, uh, northern hemisphere, southern constellations, but we're looking south now. For perspective, the, the uh, summer triangle is now over here. It was over here earlier. Um, it's now over here. Um, there are a couple interesting things to note in the uh, south facing sky in the in in the summer and uh, those are what are they i wrote them down here oh yes uh one is called albiero so so kind of turning your guys attention back to this summer triangle this constellation right here is called cygnus um and so if you're able to locate deneb as one of the vertices of the summer triangle, you can find the constellation Cygnus. Down here is a star called uh, Alber, Alberio. And Alberio is cool because for us, it looks like a single star, but if you actually had an okay telescope, you could look at it. It's actually a binary star system. And this is a particularly cool binary star system because it's one red giant star and then a, 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 blue, a blue star. So it's kind of a nice, uh, colorful image there. Uh, you don't need a really powerful telescope to see this one. Again, a lot of beginner telescopes are able to see it. Not mine. Mine's uh, too small to see a lot of these cool things, but I've used a slightly more powerful telescope to see this one. Um, actually, a lot of the stars that you see in the night sky are part of a binary or more uh, star system. So there's many stars that uh, can orbit each other that are just gravitationally locked. Um, there are a couple ideas out there that Jupiter was very nearly a star. It just didn't quite get big enough uh, to, to actually generate fusion at its core. Uh, so uh, lucky for us, because that would make it make life on Earth a lot more challenging if we had another star in, in our solar system. Um, another cool thing in the, in the southern or the south looking summer night sky is this globular cluster called M13. Uh, there's actually a, a venture capital firm in LA called M13 after this globular cluster. And this is in the constellation Hercules. So this is basically just a cluster of thousands and thousands and thousands of stars that are all very close to each other. Um, and you can see a lot of different star types in here. You can see some blue, you can see some uh, red and white stars. It's just a really, really pretty thing if you've got, if you've got a telescope and you can uh, find where it is in the night sky. Um, Oh yeah, and then one one other thing that you can see here, uh, if you look down at Sagittarius, you can see in the south facing summer night sky, kind of a streak that's running across the image here. This is the Milky Way right here, and the Milky Way is actually a lot easier to see in the the summer night sky because over the course of a year, the Earth orbits the sun. Let's say the sun's here. Um, and you know, six months later, the Earth will be over on this side of the sun. But in the summer, the Earth is between the sun and the, the center of the galaxy. And this is where there's a really high concentration, high density of stars. And so the reason why it's easier to see the Milky Way in, oops, the reason why it's easier to see the Milky Way in the summer is because you're looking in this direction where there's a lot more stars. In the winter, you're looking out here, there's just not as many stars. Stars, when they're together, they add up in brightness, which is why um, if you're in a really dark spot, you can actually see the Milky Way without any type of um, assistance from a telescope or binoculars or anything like that. Um, so that's why it's easier to see the Milky Way in the summer. And the exact center of the galaxy is right in the middle of this Sagittarius constellation. In the middle, in the middle of the galaxy right here is a supermassive black hole. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, it's like 4 million times the mass of our sun. So uh, imagine 4 million masses of our sun shrunk down into a singularity smaller than the nucleus of an atom. That's what's sitting here at the center of, at the, center of the, uh, the Milky Way. And it's uh, hypothesized that every single big galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center of its galaxy that kind of helps hold everything together along with a number of other things. Um, and, and this 
uh, black hole for us is called Sagittarius A star because it's in the direction of the Sagittarius constellation. So moving on, what's next here? Oh yes, all right, so a couple of things that you can see within our own solar system. Um, this right here is a picture of the 2007 solar eclipse. Uh, this isn't a picture I took, I wish, but um, I was fortunate to go to Glendo, Wyoming to be in the middle of the uh, total eclipse path. I took a couple of days off work in Virginia to fly home to Denver to then drive to Wyoming to make sure that I saw this because it had actually been on my radar for about 17 years. And uh, I wrote one of my college application essays about this eclipse. <laughs> so it seemed to, it seemed to have worked out. Um, the moon is actually a really cool thing to look at if you have even a really weak telescope. You can see a lot of these features. Um, you can see the South Pole here. Even, I mean, even on a really clear night when the moon looks particularly big, a lot of times you can see the South Pole of the moon. I think this is the South Pole. Um, but you can see a lot of these cool features, a lot of these craters, um, and a lot of the shadows on the moon if you have even just a, a, a modestly stronger telescope. Um, I mean, it looks like they've got some more chats. Oh, okay, it looks like, yeah, Carl uh, posted a light pollution map for those seeking dark skies. Thanks, Carl. Um, another fun thing to look at is Jupiter. Um, I, with my small telescope, cannot see Jupiter like this. I just see a slightly bigger yellow dot. But what I can see that I can't see without um, that I can't see without a telescope are these moons. And these moons are actually really cool. These are the, um, I think they're called the Jovian moons or the, the, the Galilean moons maybe. Uh, Galileo Galilei actually wrote one of the most impactful books in science ever written. And this book was called uh, Sidereus Nunicus, which means the sidereal messenger. And in this book, he looked at Jupiter over the course of, I think, about a month. And this was a time when the common belief was that everything in the universe orbited the Earth, okay? That the Earth was the center of everything. And Galileo took his uh, telescope and pointed it at Jupiter over the course of about a month. And we're able to see these four moons, which he thought were just background stars at first. And over the course of the month, he saw them changing positions. Sometimes there would be three over here and one over here, and then there'd be two over here, and then one would go back over here. And it was really curious. He didn't really know what he was looking at. And eventually he came to the conclusion that there were actually moons or you know, natural, they're called natural satellites orbiting Jupiter. And he published these results and um, was severely punished for it. Uh, but, but that there were some some religious implications at the time and uh he was he, he got in a little bit of trouble for it but eventually they uh all accepted his vision of the universe and it was really a big breakthrough here um another fun fact is that all of the planets are named after roman gods and uh jupiter is one of the main gods i think jupiter's counterpart in uh greek mythology is zeus and the moons are named after Zeus's mistresses. So it's, it's kind of fun that you've got Jupiter here surrounded by its, mis its mistresses. And what I like even more here, uh, after this story, I hope you can never say that NASA doesn't have a sense of humor. Um, NASA recently, I think in 2000, 2011, sent a satellite uh, named Juno to go study Jupiter and try to look as far through the clouds of Jupiter as possible. So, uh, you know, these rings that you see, that, that's not the surface of Jupiter, it's Jupiter's atmosphere. And so they sent this, uh, this satellite to go just look as deep into Jupiter and peer through the clouds as much as possible. And in, um, I think, either Greek or Roman mythology, uh, Zeus's wife's name was Juno, and she caught Jupiter having affairs by peering through the clouds and to see Jupiter having affairs with the Ganymede Callisto Io. So a 400 year pun in the making and, and NASA made sure to capitalize on it. Uh, so I think that's maybe one of my favorite stories about just 
space and science nerds um, really seeing an opportunity and taking advantage of it. Um, one other thing here, uh, I've, I've added some uh, notable meteor showers over the course of the year. Uh, hopefully, you know, if things are back to normal in the fall, we might be able to plan a trip around one of these, go to one of the, the dark areas from the website Carl posted earlier and see these. We just passed one a couple, couple like maybe like a week ago or so called the Lyriads. Um, but just, just something to mark your calendars if you're looking to get out of the house and to a place where uh, there's not a lot of people. Again, I can send this, uh, I'm happy to send this PowerPoint out and I've got some references at the back for you to explore further. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit. Th th that's pretty much everything that you can, or, or not, not everything, but so, some of the things that you can see in the night sky. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about space philosophy and stuff and, so, and some of the reasons why I personally have been so drawn to space over the course of my life or just the, the philosophical implications and the sheer, the sheer magnitude of it. Um, so I've, I've added this last section of the big picture just to talk about a couple of those things. Uh, first off, I want to talk about other planets. Um, and I, I, don't, I think Kepler uh, ran its mission about a decade ago. It was orbiting the Earth for, uh, I, think, I think nine years was how long its mission ran, maybe a little bit longer. But its specific mission was to look for planets that are outside of our solar system. And those are called exoplanets. Um, and over the course of its lifetime, it found thousands of planets and tens of thousands of other possible planets that are still being investigated to um, confirm or deny whether or not it's actually a planet. And over the over this time, it only looked in a really, really small area of the night sky. I think, I think it looked in an area of the night sky that was about one quarter the size of the full moon. And it found thousands and thousands of planets just looking in that direction. And so from data from the Kepler telescope, uh, it was estimated that there, there are probably at least 100 billion planets just in the Milky Way galaxy. There's anywhere between 100 billion and 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. And uh, estimates out of Kepler suggest that it's possible that there's an average of about two planets per star. Um, and uh, another estimate is that it's possible that about one in every six stars has an Earth-like planet. So if you just do the math, that's a lot of chances for life. Um, and I think it's interesting. And I think that, I mean, I think that it's, it's very difficult to get uh, to the point of complex life, but there's a, there seems to be a lot of opportunity out there. Um, there's a really, really cool uh, post. Now, there, there, there's a, a guy who runs a blog called Wait But Why, where he really dives into a really cool um, topic for that week, and he just researches it like crazy and posts a really well-considered um, blog about that thing that he was researching. And one of them, I think he posted it five or six years ago, is on this thing called the Fermi Paradox. Um, and it's all about the search for alien life and reasons why we may or may not have heard from aliens yet, considering that the, uh, the universe is about 13.6 billion years old, 13.8 billion years old. And the Earth itself is only about four, four and a half billion years old. So there was a lot of time for life to develop uh, between them uh, or but between the time that the, the universe came into existence and, and the earth came into existence. Um, and if you just kind of think about the rate of technological change, you know, if you just do a thought experiment about, you know, if I were to say, explain how a cell phone works to somebody who lived 200 years ago, how would you do that? I mean, that, that was a time when they didn't have electricity, when they didn't have anything even remotely in the beginnings of, of a cell phone. And so where would you even start? And would it even be worth your time? Now, if you take that mentality and move forward 200 years from now, is it going to be the same type of situation where they're going to have technology that's not even worth explaining to us? What if you go further than 200 years? What if you go 1,000 years? What if you go a million years into the future? What will that technology like? And will we be, even be able to comprehend it? These are a couple of questions that were posed by, by the Fermi paradox and you know, whether or not there may or may not be, be aliens out there, but they're just some really interesting questions to consider. Um, 
one other thing that's even a larger scale than that is this background image that I've used for the vast majority of my presentation. This is a real image and it's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And basically what the context was, um, Hubble, the Hubble telescope is about a school bus sized telescope that's in orbit around the Earth. It's been up there for about 30 years. Um, and it's well exceeded its lifetime. It was only supposed to work for like eight years and they've been able to keep it going for 30 years. Um, but over the course of about 11 or 12 days, they picked a really, uh, a scientist picked a really dark area in the night sky to just point the Hubble at and keep it, keep it looking at that one area, just to gather as much light as possible. Uh, because the, the more light you have, uh, the better images you can create, the more you can see. And this is what came back. Every single dot that you see here is a galaxy. It's not a star. Every single dot is a different galaxy. And some of these galaxies, like this, this one over here, are 10, 12 billion light years away. It's about as far away as it can be. And, and actually, the, an interesting thing here is that the more red the galaxy is in this image, the further away it is. Um, there's, a, there's a thing in, in astrophysics called the, the red shift, the Hubble red shift. Um, which basically just says that the things that are far away from us are moving away from us even faster. And um, for reasons that I won't get into, that makes the galaxy look more red. Um, so like this one in particular is very, very, very far away. But then this one where you can actually see a couple features on it significantly closer. Um, but here's the crazy thing about the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is the full size of the image. And Again, it just looked in one tiny area of the night sky. And I have the moon here for comparison. Um, the size of the area that it looked at was this big. Um, it was one tenth the size of the full moon, was the square area that they pointed the Hubble at. And again, they pointed it as a very dark area of the night sky where they didn't really think there was anything there. And the universe has a, a property called isotropy, which means it looks pretty much the same in any direction that you look. Meaning that in every single area of this size of the night sky, you can assume that there are about this many galaxies in that direction. So next time you go outside and you look at the night sky, just imagine this number of galaxies. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the night sky each with hundreds of billions of stars on average. Um, fun, fun piece of perspective. There are more, significantly more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the Earth. Um, so kind of, kind of crazy there. Um, but where's this all going? This, this effectively kind of takes me to my favorite quote by a guy named Carl Sagan. He was a famous, uh, a famous physicist and science communicator. Uh, he was the leader of these satellites that were launched in the 70s called Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Um, I don't remember which of those two satellites took this picture, but when the satellite, I think, was 4 billion miles away from Earth, Carl Sagan had the team turn the camera around on the satellite and take a picture of the Earth. And you know how when you take a picture of something that's close to the sun, you get a sun streak through the image? Well, when you're 4 billion miles away from the Earth, the Earth, for context, the Earth is 93 million miles from the sun. So when you're 4 billion miles away, that 93 million miles becomes very, very small. So everything is close to the sun when you're 4 billion miles away from the sun. And so it, it captured this image and Earth just perfectly ends up in the middle of this sun streak. And Carl Sagan, there's, there's an entire Wikipedia page about this specific image. And Carl Sagan has about a three page reflection on this image. And in it, he says, that's here, that's home. But he basically talks about how big the universe is and how fragile the earth is with respect to just the rest of the cosmic events. We are in an incredibly fortunate position and we are incredibly lucky to be where we are today. And you know, I'm not, I'm not trying at all to trivialize any issues or anything like that, but sometimes when I'm feeling stressed or I'm feeling overwhelmed, I like to kind of take a step back and think of this bigger space, cosmic perspective, whatever you want to call it. And it, and it just kind of makes whatever the thing is that I'm struggling with that at that moment not seem as big. 
Um, and that, and that, that, you know, helps me personally. Um, but I highly uh, suggest uh, that you all go uh, check out this image. I, I sh this is probably the first reference that I should have included, but somehow I forgot it. Um, but definitely go check this out, read his reflections on it. It's again, it's only three paragraphs, but it is a very well considered, beautiful quote about kind of the status of the human condition and, and, and how fortunate we are to be in the position that we are in. Um, so that's everything that I've got. Uh, here are some of the references, the constellations, meteor showers, telescopes, uh, the Fermi paradox that I talked about earlier. And then this awesome YouTube channel, they cover a lot more than just space and physics stuff. They cover a lot of other great things. Um, it's an animated channel, but they do the animations very, very well. Um, and you should definitely go give this a look. But um, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Um, otherwise, I, I really appreciate uh, everybody who joined in. Looks like we've got five minutes till seven o'clock, but I'm, I'm happy to stay on and answer questions if anyone, if anyone has them. Hi, Taylor. Yeah. I had Appreciate one of the things, like as you were mentioning that I've also seen the, uh, the nature in terms of more neutron stars and black holes and whatnot, but I've never seen this whole thing from the way of constellations. And I'm always wondering, cause we don't have that level of resolution with whatever things that we are seeing these uh, or constellations so are they all made up of stars or some points are even galaxies because both of them in the night sky actually appears to be the same right unless we go into higher resolutions of these uh, all the constellations that you can see are stars um, some of them are binary or trinary star systems but they are all stars uh, in order to see a galaxy uh, like i guess in in the background here, um, we can go back to the this. Uh, I know these look like points, and and you know the, these each individually are galaxies. But the only way that we're able to see them is you know with a really big telescope looking in this direction for a really long time. Uh, any galaxies that would just look like points to us are far far too dim for us to see with with our naked eye. So every constellation that you see is um, a star. And some of the things that look a little fuzzy, those might be globular clusters. And the three exceptions are the large and small Magellanic clouds that you can see from the Southern Hemisphere and the Andromeda galaxy that you can see from, definitely from the Northern Hemisphere. I don't know if you can see it from the Southern Hemisphere, but it looks just kind of like a little fuzzy oval um, if you're in a spot that, that's dark enough. I'm All right, and one more thing uh, on that. So now all these stars are from the Milky Way, right? Yes. And not beyond that. Yeah, yeah. Again, unless you're looking at those, those uh, galaxies that I mentioned earlier, every single star is, is in the Milky Way. Got it. And so is there a way to see the planarness of the Milky Way? Because I was thinking like the whole uh, Milky Way is very planar in the sense that there is one strict plane where all the stars are condensed and the rest, they are very sparsed out, right? But when yes. you were mentioning that we can see a lot many stars in the northern hemisphere, and then and they are constant right uh, throughout the year we can see them and the rest change uh, according to the seasons. So I was wondering, is there a way to see that see that planarness of the Milky Way as well? Yeah. So um, northern hemisphere in the southern in the or in the in the summer, if you're looking south, uh, you can kind of make it out on this image. Uh, I mean, this isn't an image, this is an animation, but you see kind of a, a streak right here of, of clouds and like maybe a, a little bit of like white and dust. Um, this, this is the Milky Way and this, this is that planarness that you were talking about. You know, out here, when you're looking out here, you're looking you know, up above the Milky Way out of it. And when you're looking down here, you're looking down beneath the Milky Way. But when you see this, this is the plane of the Milky Way. Okay, got it. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Sure. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, again, I really appreciate everyone uh, jumping in on this. I, I always love talking about space and sharing some of the stuff that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about. And uh, Carl, thanks for the opportunity.
I appreciate you guys uh, opening up the position of Nocturnal Adventures and uh, hopefully we can get out there sometime in the fall or winter next year to uh, actually see these things in real life. That's awesome, man. Thanks so much, Taylor. Sure thing. All right, well, I will stop.